name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In today's Gospel reading, we hear some statements that our modern world would not approve of. The reason why the world would not approve of these statements is because Christ speaks in an unpleasant manner to his own disciples. He criticizes them. No, even worse, he scolds them and offends them by pointing out what they did wrong. Jesus, one could say, put them down. He put them down by pointing out what they were lacking. Now, can you imagine a teacher scolding his students? Perhaps in some way, we would like to think of that action, of that activity, as being something normal, natural. Not today. Not anymore. Frankly, it's difficult for teachers today to criticize, never mind scold, their students. And certainly not by pointing out inadequacies. Can you imagine, perhaps, a supervisor making a statement such as the one Christ did to his employees? to the people working for him. No. No, because it would be considered and deemed offensive. That's because we have become a very easily offendable society. Everything offends us. But before I return to this, to the core of this, let's imagine and try to understand a little better what's happening in this situation, in this little passage from the evangelist Matthew. Why was Jesus upset with his disciples? These are his closest attachés. Why was he upset with them? You see, the man who sought healing for his son said that he took his son to many different people to seek healing, and frankly, no one could heal the epileptic young man, not even the disciples of Christ. You see, the disciples tried to heal this boy by themselves, of their own knowledge, with their own prayer, rather than by God's intervention. Here we have a very straightforward example, actually, of ego haughtiness and pride. Perhaps all of us, when we need help, seek out all kinds of support all over the place with all kinds of different resources of our own, with knowledge of our own. And even when we accomplish those things and when we actually find solutions, we fail to see those solutions as Christ being at work in the world through our hands and through the hands of other people. Too often, we place our faith in ourselves. Now, the Lord surely does not mind healing an epileptic boy. Of course not. He wants to bring healing to someone who is sick. We see him doing that time and time again all throughout the scriptures. Surely the Lord wants to bring peace and comfort to a suffering father who watches his son struggle with an illness that there is no cure that he can find with any other healer. Of course the Lord wants all those things. But he also wants us to see that healing and comfort for the suffering of the world comes not from our knowledge, comes not from our power, 
but from a power that comes from above, from a healing which is divine. The Lord teaches all of us through this lesson that anything that we accomplish or we try to accomplish for the good and health of persons and communities alike, we must do in oneness with Him, with Him who is God. Jesus, being true God, and being the initiator of all that is good, reminds in this situation His disciples and us today, that if we are to succeed in good and holy pursuits, we must pursue that respective work with Christ God as the one acting through us. Perhaps that's easy to understand and even accept. But herein lies another danger yet. Herein lies another danger and another deceit of our modern world, the danger of believing that everything I seek to do is going to be blessed by God simply because I say in Jesus' name or simply because I said a prayer asking for God to help me accomplish whatever task. This, brothers and sisters, is the other side of that same coin. It's really the other deception of the devil, which really leads us to the same place. The belief that by simply reciting some words of magic, God will fulfill that which is my will, no matter what my will might be. We spoke at greater length about will last Sunday. But that's not true, my dear friends. Prayers and simply a proclamation in Jesus' name is not the solution. This isn't magic. This isn't open sesame, closed sesame. God does not actually make it so just because we mention His name here and there. If we believe that, we end up walking around with simply pretense and a delusion of our own making. I want to paint, I want to describe an illustration to you in your own minds and in mine as well. Have you ever attended an event, some kind of event where there is a special guest, an honored person. Perhaps all of you have. And perhaps in some cases you have been that special guest who is being honored. I have had the unpleasant experience to be in such situations. And every time I am in a situation like that, and every time I hear it for someone else, but especially when we are at events like this, we hear usually the main speaker describe the special honored guest with such magnificent accolades that we are all in awe. And that's the intent. The intent is to actually place us in a state of awe at everything this honored person has accomplished. Whenever that happens to me, <laughs> I end up feeling like there's got to be another person by the name of Timothy Sass who was born in Romania and serves as a priest in Minnesota and because all of the accomplishments that are listed, I find, are frankly just situations which are with good results, but I have simply found myself to be there. Looking back at things that people list as accomplishments under my name, I find that they could have been accomplished just as easily with another name, with another person. And frankly, even where I do have contributions, I find my contributions to be useless and insufficient 
without the presence of many others, without the presence of other people. No one person accomplishes anything in a void. Not one of us is called out to live in a bottle. There is not one person who is born and dies in this world who is sufficient in and of himself. And all that is good which comes out of our hands and our mouths and our thoughts and our writing and our labor, all that is good comes because Christ God blessed it to come through us simply as a tool, simply as a vehicle. The reason I share this with you, my dear brothers and sisters, is not to put you down, is not to actually diminish your self-confidence. No, I want you to be confident. But I want you to be confident in the you who is the true image and likeness of God. In that person who actually proclaims Christ God in all that he accomplishes. I don't want to take away credit from anyone. Frankly, if my name goes erased after I die, it shall be for my salvation. I simply want all of us to admit that whatever good we accomplish in Christ Jesus happens with the presence of Jesus. So how is Jesus present? And this is my conclusion really. How is Jesus present with us today? How can I, a disciple, heal a pe an a epileptic son of a suffering and weeping father today when I cannot turn to Jesus in the flesh for him to heal the son and comfort the father. Brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus is alive with all of us in action. All of us being at work together with prayer and fasting. For you see, when Jesus tells his disciples in this gospel we just read, that such a great miracle can only be done by prayer and fasting, he essentially told them, it's outside of you alone. And if it is outside of me alone, it is only accomplished in me together with all others who seek to be members, minuscule members as we are, of the body of Christ, alive and at work in the world. And you see, brothers and sisters, I was not diminishing your self-confidence. I was not putting you down, because Christ is not putting his disciples down. I simply want you to see how much greater we are when we see ourselves as simply one member of the one Christ God who is indeed perfect, who is indeed capable of healing anything, who is indeed capable of accomplishing something through my faith that isn't even as great as the seed of a mustard. Some of you have probably read a book that's become rather popular in the last three years. The name of the book is Who, Not How. I'm sure that some of you have read it. It's quite popular. It was written by a fantastic, fantastic mind in the world of entrepreneurial development by the name of Dan Sullivan. Most people had never heard of Dan Sullivan prior to this book that was published in 2020, published it with another, another great mind, Ben Harpy, who is a, a younger man, but an instructor in, uh, 
in um, organizational psychology. Dan Sullivan has actually been prolific with his writing and teachings, especially as an entrepreneurial coach, for at least three decades. I've been reading him since, since grad school. And I'm not even sure whether he's a believer or not. I don't know much about his personal life. But in reading that book a couple of years back, Who, Not How, which actually points out that it's really the partnerships that we establish that bring accomplishment. It reminded me really time and time again at how much we depend on one another, how much we need each other so that that which we proclaim here on Sunday morning becomes manifested in our co-ministry, in our co-labor, in all things which are good, in Christ, in the world, in the communities around us, with people whom we know and love, and with strangers we'll never meet. Brothers and sisters, I cannot quite explain to you how large a mustard seed of faith is. But I do firmly believe that if we stick together being the who for each other in Christ's work in the world, indeed Christ will move mountains through us. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.